The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And question number one, I call Doug. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we stood together in a minute silence to mark International Violence Against Women Day. Tragically, in Scotland, more and more women become victims of crime each year. Last year saw the largest year on year rise in domestic abuse charges, and the number of sexual crimes has more than doubled since 2007. We know that women suffer these horrific crimes far more than men. It is the first task of this government, indeed any government, to keep the public safe. Does the First Minister have confidence in her government's ability to keep women across Scotland safe? First Minister. I am uh, not complacent about the risks and the threats uh, of abuse, harassment and violence, often very serious violence, uh, that women are subjected to in Scotland and around the world every single day. Uh, that is why I welcome, uh, I do so with a sense of great regret that it is necessary this uh, United Nations International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against uh, Women and the 16 Days of Action that will follow. Um, so I do not believe that any government uh, in the UK uh, or indeed any government across the world is yet doing enough to protect women. Uh, of course, uh, the source of violence against women uh, is men who commit uh, those acts of violence. Uh, but I do uh, believe uh, this government is taking important action. Uh, for example, and this is relevant to the point Douglas Ross uh, rightly points to about the increase in uh, reports of domestic abuse. That is in part because we have extended the law to cover uh, more examples of behaviour and, and classify that as domestic abuse. And it's to the credit of this Parliament uh, that it did so. Uh, that is an important step forward. It means that uh, behaviour that was previously not criminalised is now criminalised. Uh, we've also increased funding for the organisations that work on behalf of women. Um, and it's important, of course, that courts uh, treat seriously uh, the actions uh, that lead to convictions. Uh, so I believe this government, indeed this Parliament, is taking important steps forward. Uh, but I also believe even more strongly that there is much more still to be done. Douglas Ross. I absolutely agree. There is much, much more that still needs to be done. Last week I raised the case of Esther Brown. She was raped and murdered by a criminal with a long and appalling history of violence against women. Just this morning, we heard that there have finally been arrests in the murder of schoolgirl Caroline Glacken more than 25 years ago. She was found dead on the morning of her mother's 40th birthday. Another tragic loss of life we have raised numerous times before in this chamber is that of Michelle Stewart. She was murdered in 2008 near her home in Ayrshire. Just a few weeks ago, her sister Lisa wrote to the First Minister's Justice Secretary to ask for an update on Michelle's law. This is a series of reforms to toughen up the justice system that my party supports. Specifically, Lisa asked about the tagging and GPS monitoring of those released on licence and who have committed serious and violent crimes. She said the former Justice Secretary, who is speaking to the First Minister right now, committed to having a scheme up and running by November 2021. With one week to go, will that promise to a grieving family be kept? First Minister. Well, first of all, can I uh, say, in relation to the arrests that are reported uh, this morning, I obviously, uh, in common with uh, all other members, cannot comment on the substance of that. But I think it is an important indication that no matter how many years pass uh, from horrendous crimes that are committed, uh, those responsible for those crimes, uh, wherever possible, will be brought uh, to justice. And I think that does, uh, on this day in particular, send an important message. Um, in terms of of uh, Michelle Stewart, uh, I will ensure that the letter uh, that has been written receives a full uh, response. Uh, we have taken forward uh, a number of reforms uh, in response uh, to calls made in the wake of that tragic case and indeed other uh, tragic cases. I will ensure I write to uh, Douglas Ross and place the, the letter in spice about the, the progress and uh, the timing of the particular uh, change in reform uh, that he is, is asking for. I, I do not uh, want to 
uh, say uh, definitively that this is the case here, but everybody in this chamber knows that certain uh, commitments, certain strands of work have uh, unavoidably uh, been affected because of uh, what we've been dealing with collectively over the past uh, two years. But these are important uh, measures uh, that we need to continue to take and keep our minds open uh, to taking in order that we do all we can uh, to keep women safe, to ensure that those who commit acts of violence against women are brought to justice, and of course to deal with uh, much more effectively in future uh, than society has done in the past with the underlying causes of violence against women, uh, which is the behaviour of some men in our society. Douglas Ross. I will appreciate any response I get from the First Minister in, in a letter or, or any other way, but this was a promise made to a family who have gone through the worst of circumstances that none of us can imagine. And with less than a week to go, it sounds like that promise is not going to be kept. Mm. And it's not the only promise that has been broken to the Stewart family and others like them. Just a few weeks ago, Lisa Stewart also said this about her sister's murderer. We get no warning that he's out in our local area. What happens if we come across him? Is any thought given to the victims? Again, this is not an isolated example. Victims are routinely left in the dark about where the criminal who ruined their lives ends up and when they're being let out. Right now, there are around 4,500 criminals serving sentences of up to 18 months for crimes including sexual assault and domestic violence who have a release date that their victim could be told about. That's 4,500 victims of crime who could be informed when their offender will be released from prison. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many of those victims have in fact been notified? First Minister. Uh, uh, the reason I'm saying that I will write in detail to Douglas Ross um, and make uh, the terms of that letter available in SPICE, which uh, effectively is, is making that available publicly, is I want to make sure uh, that I give proper detailed answers to these very important points. We are taking forward work on all of these strands. Um, it is the case, and you know, this frustrates me uh, as much as it frustrates other politicians. Uh, of course, it doesn't frustrate us nearly as much as I know it will frustrate the, the families of victims of crime. But these are often uh, complex reforms that have to be done properly in order that our overall justice system uh, is performing in the way that we want it to. So, for example, on notification, part of this work has been uh, making changes to the victim notification scheme uh, to ensure that uh, victims uh, do have uh, proper notice where that is appropriate. Uh, for example, where uh, people are on parole, that there is uh, the ability for uh, victims to be notified. So I want to make sure uh, that we set out in detail uh, where all of the different strands of that work uh, has got to. Um, I don't uh, believe it is the case that we are not taking forward uh, important changes and reforms here. We are. We have talked about these uh, rightly many times before in this chamber, but it is really important. Um, there are a uh, few issues, uh, and I know I will be speaking uh, on behalf of many people, in particular many women uh, across the country right now, there are few issues uh, that I care more passionately about than doing everything possible to keep women in our society safer uh, from the violence that too often women are subjected to. There is more we need to do, there is more we are doing, um, and it is something I take extremely seriously, and I know that is a view shared across my government and indeed across this parliament. Douglas Ross. The first said victims have to have proper notice. The answer to my question about out of 4,500 potential victims of these cases, how many had been notified? The answer is 37. 37 of these victims right now are aware of where the offender in their case and when they're going to be released. 37. Less than 1% of these victims know when that criminal who ruined their life is going to get out. How can women who suffer the most horrific crimes and their families feel safe when they are kept in the dark about the release of dangerous offenders? They have no idea if they will be walking down the street in their own community and come face to face with their attacker. The justice system is stacked against victims. We have to change this to prevent another case like what happened to Caroline Glacken. To prevent another case like what happened to Esther Brown. To prevent another case like what happened to Michelle Stewart. When will the First Minister's government finally take the action desperately needed to keep women safe from these crimes? First Minister. These are important issues. I, I don't 
believe it is the case that the justice system is stacked against victims, um, and, and I do not think that is a fair representation. But I do believe it is the case that the justice system, like all parts of our society, has to uh, change to respond better uh, to the needs of women who are subject to uh, violence. And I uh, readily accept that responsibility. Uh, it is the case that the government is taking forward a range of changes and reforms because some of what Douglas Ross has cited is not good enough. Victim notification is one of those areas. Uh, it is important to say, and I, I do not say this uh, in, in mean to suggest that it is in the, any way the majority, uh, there will be some victims of crime who do not want uh, that information for reasons uh, that are important to them. So it is really important that in all of these things, uh, the needs and the wants of victims are to the fore, uh, that the justice system is responsive, uh, that it is not defensive, that we are always looking at how we reform and change the justice system in order uh, to address these very legitimate concerns. But the final point I would make here is not in any way to downplay uh, the issues we are discussing here today, uh, but the justice system uh, responds to crimes after they have been committed, rightly so, and needs to do that appropriately and effectively. But we also all have a duty to do much more, and this does not just apply to Scotland, this applies globally, much more to stop the violence happening to women in the first place. Um, and that uh, does mean changing profoundly uh, the culture uh, that exists in many countries around this. So this is, I'm glad this issue has been raised today, given uh, what today represents. I accept my responsibility in Scotland to make sure all of these issues are addressed and that we take forward these changes and reforms, because all of us have a duty to do everything that we can to keep women as safe as possible from violence. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, last week, I raised the case of Andrew Lawrence, who died in the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow after contracting a fungal infection, Aspergillus, linked to water and the environment. Since raising this in the chamber last week, I have been contacted by a senior clinician at the hospital who has revealed there was another case of Aspergillus in a child cancer patient around the same time and in the same ward as Andrew. That child tragically died. When a hospital reports a serious infection like Aspergillus, a red report should be filed and the health secretary informed. Did this happen? Were you aware of this death? And what action was taken? First Minister. I will uh, look into the specific issue that has been raised and I will uh, come back to Anna Sarwar. These are, again, important uh, issues. Uh, I do not have the details of the case he is raising, uh, but I will certainly, as a priority, look into this. Uh, after uh, last week's exchanges um, and uh, after the concerns, very serious uh, concerns that were raised uh, by Louise Lawrence, uh, Andrew's uh, wife, the government has uh, taken uh, further action. Obviously, these concerns require to be fully and properly investigated. I have written uh, to Louise Lawrence uh, already today confirming initial actions that are being taken in light of those concerns. Uh, that includes an independent external uh, review of Andrew's case notes. In terms of the more general concerns uh, the, of uh, Aspergillus infection at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the Health Secretary has asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to carry out uh, a wider review and any necessary action as a result of these strands of work uh, will be taken. But on the additional case that Anna Sarwar has raised, I undertake to uh, look into that as a matter of urgency uh, and write to him once I have had the opportunity to do so. Anna Sarwar. That sounds like no. What is the point of a Scottish Government Oversight Board? What is the point of it? And the First Minister says about a review, I am sorry, waiting for a public inquiry or talking more about process is not going to save people's lives. So that response is simply not good enough. That didn't, the public inquiries and the reviews did not prevent the death of Andrew Lawrence. It did not prevent the death of this child from Aspergillus. But most devastating of all, there are still infections happening right now. A second clinician, in fear of speaking out because of bullying and intimidation, has told me that in the last two months, the last two months, there has been another child who acquired a waterborne infection like Millie Main and died. Another case in the last two months and another child dead. The holding answers are no longer good enough. This is gross negligence. The First Minister needs to act now, stop infections and save lives.
First Minister. It is really important that, uh, any, let me say this uh, very clearly and very bluntly, no clinician uh, should fear uh, bullying or intimidation in coming forward. Um, and, well, Anna Sauer says they have been, so it is incumbent on me as First Minister to stand here and very clearly uh, say that that will not uh, be tolerated in our National Health Service. When concerns are raised, it is important that there is proper and full investigation to determine uh, whether there are uh, relationships between uh, infections, uh, which a lot of work, considerable amount of work, uh, is underway on a daily basis in the National Health Service to reduce the incidence of um, and uh, people becoming seriously ill and, and dying. It's important that proper investigation is underway, which is why uh, what I have said today is important, so that we establish the facts, because that then informs the actions that require to be taken, and that is vital. Uh, what is also vital is to recognise uh, that the government does that. It is absolutely correct uh, that processes are established to ensure proper wider investigation and scrutiny. That is why the independent review uh, and the case note review that was undertaken previously and now the independent statutory public inquiry is important, but it is simply not the case to say that nothing else is being done uh, while we await the findings of those. Uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board is right now at the highest level of escalation in terms of the Health Board uh, performance framework at stage four, which uh, is often referred to as special measures. Uh, that means there is a significant amount of work underway uh, to address infection uh, in hospitals and to reduce the incidence of infection. So these are important uh, matters, but when these concerns are raised, it is really important, and it is not... It is not uh, trying to deny responsibility to say that real serious investigation to establish the facts is important, and I hope Anna Sarwar will accept that. Anna Sarwar. That answer is simply unacceptable and complacent. Millie Main died in 2017, and there was a similar infection in a child two months ago that lost their lives. Hiding behind process isn't going to bring people back to life or stop infections right now. So can I remind the First Minister that she's been in charge of the scandal from start to finish. This has happened and continues to happen on your watch. Right now, the Health Board are attempting to deflect blame onto the clinical staff. This is a failure of leadership. The Health Board has failed, the Scottish Government Oversight Board has failed, and frankly, the First Minister continues to fail. Staff are being bullied and intimidated now I've been raising this in this chamber for years and I've heard the same answers and the same excuses. Infections are happening now. Patients are dying now. Last week, the cause of Andrew Slaughter's death was revealed. This week, the death of two children. Another week of dithering and inaction simply won't cut it. Sack the leadership of the health board today. Sack the oversight board today and use your emergency powers to take control of this hospital. First Minister, how many more families will have to be devastated before you do the right thing? First Minister. Sacking a health board uh, does not change uh, overnight the practice in a hospital. Uh, that is why the actual work has to be done. When concerns are raised about the cause of someone's death, then that has to be properly investigated so that the action that is then taken as a result of that is the right action. And it is not right to say that no action has been taken over four years. Uh, Anna Sarwar says to me, use your emergency powers to take control of the hospital. Uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, as I said, is at uh, the highest level of escalation and will remain there uh, while all of these issues are investigated and action is taken. Uh, these are serious matters. They are serious matters all of us should take seriously. Uh, but we do not uh, do justice to the families concerned if we simply uh, call for uh, action that is not based on proper investigation, proper scrutiny um, and proper consideration. And that's the duty of government and that is the duty we will continue to take seriously. Thank you. We'll now move to supplementary questions and I call Eleanor Whittam. In light of your polling... In light of the appalling loss of life off the coast of France yesterday, can I ask the First Minister if she will make the strongest possible representations to the UK Government to do whatever is required to prevent such needless tragedies happening again? 
First Minister. Uh, well, I want to take the opportunity to express my deepest sympathy at the loss of 27 lives in the English Channel yesterday. Uh, that was a tragic and shocking loss that will be felt deeply, not just here in the UK, but across the world. Uh, those seeking refuge are human beings. Uh, they are driven out of desperation into boats crossing the Channel uh, and by a lack of humanitarian alternative routes. Um, I uh, believe uh, that it is important uh, that these issues are addressed addressed and they are addressed uh, with the needs of human beings in mind. Uh, we should be working together to ensure that those seeking refuge get protection from exploitation, not punishment or criminalisation. Uh, they need rescue, not diversion back into treacherous waters. Uh, Scottish ministers have repeatedly called for a much more humane approach to asylum and we will continue to do so in the wake of this dreadful tragedy. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, a constituent in my region has contacted me in distress as her 16-year-old vaccinated daughter has now contracted long COVID and is struggling to access treatment for the condition and since September has been absent from school. Her GP wrote to Forth Valley and was advised they cannot treat her as they do not support long COVID. First Minister, this is a shocking situation for any constituent and for any child who feels that they are being abandoned by the health system. Therefore, what action can be put in place to ensure that this situation is rectified as a matter of urgency? First Minister. Obviously, I have not seen the terms of the correspondence uh, referred to from Forth Valley, but all health boards have a duty to support patients uh, with long COVID. We have uh, made significant investments to develop services for people uh, with long COVID, including uh, children, uh, and obviously their needs will often be very uh, particular. Uh, it is, of course, uh, for clinicians to determine uh, the, the correct uh, treatment and services available. Uh, but if the member uh, wishes to write to the Health Secretary with details of the constituency case, uh, I know the Health Secretary will We'll look into that and respond further. Willie Rennie. Yeah, the examination of deaths in care homes uh, with residents admitted without uh, being tested deserves to be illuminated with good statistics and timely statistics without manipulation um, from government ministers. But we know two ministers interfered on the publication to delay it on another report. So does the minister, First Minister not understand that suspicion about the interference with Public Health Scotland is swirling around and the best way to deal with that suspicion is to publish the report into care home deaths now? First Minister. Um, I, I, don't, I absolutely do not accept uh, that characterisation and um, I think that does a great disservice uh, not to Scottish ministers but to those who are working hard and have worked so incredibly hard over these past uh, months uh, in Public Health Scotland. Um, Public Health Scotland has made it absolutely clear that no data was withheld. Data on deaths in care homes uh, were incorporated into the discharges from NHS Scotland hospitals to care homes report that was published on the 21st of April. And of course, uh, deaths in care homes, uh, in common with all aspects of the handling of the pandemic, uh, will be the subject of the independent inquiry, uh, and we will shortly announce further details of that. Jackie Bailey. As we've heard, the report on care home deaths due to COVID was not published prior to the election. The First Minister is aware that there was no barrier to them doing so, as their own guidance states that they can publish information even in an election period. So it seems the report was suppressed for political reasons. Now, we know that secrecy and spin are at the very heart of the SNP, but it seems to have infected Public Health Scotland too. Why did they need to protect the SNP government? And will the First Minister ensure that the report is now published? First Minister. Um, I, I really think that is a, a slur on the good people who work in Public Health Scotland, day in and day out, trying to help this country uh, through... Jackie Bailey said uh, the Public Health Scotland reputation as well as ministers. Now, I accept uh, criticism of ministers readily in this chamber. Um, that is a, a proper part of the democratic process. But those working in Public Health Scotland do not deserve that. And let yeah. me put on yeah. the record my thanks to them. I'm not sure if Jackie Bailey heard uh, the, the terms of my answer to Willie Rennie, but let me repeat it. Uh, Public Health Scotland has made it clear that no data was withheld. Data on deaths in care home were incorporated in the discharges from NHS Scotland hospitals to care home report published on the 21st of April, which, if memory serves me correctly, was before the election. Marie McNair. 
Thank you, President Officer. Can the First Minister give an initial update on the rollout of the child disability payment? First Minister. And accepting applications for the child disability payment on Monday. Uh, this followed a successful pilot in Dundee City, uh, Perth and Kinross and the Western Isles. Uh, this is another important milestone in the devolution of social security powers uh, for disability benefits. Uh, statistics uh, on uptake will be published in the normal manner, but initial information shows that it is going uh, well. So that's important. And anybody listening who thinks they might uh, be eligible for that payment, I would encourage them to make inquiries and apply. Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, NHS Tayside has raised serious concerns about missed outpatient appointments, with 1,846 people failing to attend last week alone. That's almost 10% of bookings. Given the implications for cost, delayed treatment and waiting times, what action is the Scottish Government taking to encourage people to attend their NHS appointments. First Minister. Obviously, we encourage uh, people to attend appointments that they are given. We know uh, largely because of the COVID experience uh, there are significant waiting times uh, for both outpatient and inpatient elective uh, care. Uh, therefore, it is really important that people do get appointments, that they attend those appointments. If they can't attend those appointments, of course, they should contact their health board to rearrange uh, so that that slot uh, can be allocated to someone else. So we will always uh, take steps uh, to encourage uh, that but more fundamentally, uh, we're taking steps backed by significant investment to increase the overall capacity of the NHS to ensure that more appointments are available uh, and we start uh, to tackle the backlog in waiting times that has developed over the past two years. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Rape Crisis Scotland's Survivor Reference Group Police Responses in Scotland report. First Minister. We welcome the publication of the report by the Survivor Reference Group and commend the courage of those who have come forward to share their experience. Uh, we will consider the findings uh, from uh, this report, although some of the recommendations are an operational matter for Police Scotland. Uh, we are determined to ensure that the justice system does respond better to the needs of survivors in Scotland and will continue to prioritise support for victims of sexual crime as well as work to identify ways to prevent offending in the first place. Uh, we recognise the key role that advocacy services such as Rape Crisis Scotland uh, play and, uh, in helping victims come forward and engage with the justice process, which is why we fully fund its national advocacy project. Maggie Chapman. Can I thank the First Minister for that response and acknowledge how seriously I know she takes this issue. Today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and that we will be debating that, this issue later on today. Sexism and misogyny remain entrenched in our society and the rise in reports of domestic abuse and sexual crimes should ring alarm bells for us all. The Rape Crisis Scotland Survivor Reference Group report reveals concerns about how these reports are dealt with by police. It makes it clear how important understanding and awareness of trauma is both for justice and for recovery. It also makes clear that survivors of colour or those from different cultural backgrounds are least able to access justice. In the First Minister's view, what can we all do to ensure our criminal justice system does not prevent minoritised and marginalised women in particular from being given fair and equal access to pursue justice? First Minister. Well, first of all, we have to recognise uh, what Maggie Chapman has outlined there. Uh, women, uh, all women uh, suffer in some way, shape or form at some point in their life, uh, sexism and misogyny. Uh, unfortunately, too many women uh, suffer very serious uh, violence and abuse and harassment. Uh, but within that, uh, women of colour um, and uh, other uh, minority groups uh, will suffer uh, disproportionately, uh, but also in some cases find access to justice even more difficult. That is something all aspects of the justice system has to take very seriously. I know that Police Scotland does take that seriously and will take very seriously uh, the recommendations for it in this uh, report. This is something that at all levels all of us must do uh, more to address in order that uh, the next generations of girls growing up in Scotland and around the world do not uh, suffer the same uh, as those who have gone before them. Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, Presenting Officer. I have previously raised the often torturous journey of women who are navigating their way through the judicial system and who have been brave enough to come forward in the report when they have been victims of sexual crime. That includes the continual re-traumatisation and secondary abuse that the continual retelling of their story to agencies involved heaps upon them. 
Does the First Minister agree it is imperative that victims have full confidence in the reporting process and that the judicial system will treat them with dignity and compassion? And will she commit to reviewing these procedures to ensure that victims feel able to approach the police without delay or hesitation? Because that is not the experience being reported all too often. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, we must make sure that women uh, have the confidence to come forward, uh, that they uh, feel that they will be appropriately uh, treated when they come forward, that their uh, concerns and reports will be taken seriously and uh, all due process uh, will be applied, but that their needs uh, will be treated uh, sensitively and sympathetically. I think all of us as politicians, when we are talking about these things, uh, have a duty also to make sure that how we talk about them do not inadvertently put women off uh, coming forward uh, in this uh, way. And all parts of the justice system uh, need to make sure that they are looking at their processes uh, and systems in place uh, to, to make sure that that is not just rhetoric, that is reality. I know that is something uh, the Crown Office takes seriously. I know it's something the police take seriously. I know absolutely it's something this government takes very seriously. Uh, we are uh, funding uh, a number of the organisations that work directly with women to support them through the criminal justice process. And indeed, uh, in the first 100 days after uh, the re-election of this government, uh, we directed new funding to rape crisis centres and domestic abuse services uh, to help cut the waiting list in specialist support services. So uh, across all parts of our justice system, all parts of society, there are many things uh, that all of us need to do to make sure that the experience of women is improved uh, when they do suffer uh, violence and abuse, but of course we have to do more uh, to prevent that in the first place. Question number four, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether nuclear power is an essential part of Scotland's transition to net zero. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Energy Strategy, uh, which was published in 2017, confirmed uh, the Scottish Government's continued opposition to new nuclear power stations under current technologies. Uh, significant growth in renewables, storage, hydrogen and carbon capture provides the best pathway to net zero by 2045 and will deliver the decarbonisation we need to see across industry, heat and transport. Uh, we believe that nuclear power represents poor value for consumers. This is evidenced uh, very strongly by the contract awarded by the UK Government to Hinkley Point C nuclear station in 2016, which will result in energy consumers subsidising its operation until 2060. Uh, to date, the project costs for Hinkley uh, have soared from £18 billion in 2016 to £23 billion today, while first generation from the site is not expected until June 2026, six months later than planned. Bill Kidd. Thank the First Minister for that response. Uh, the people of Scotland have consistently voted for a government that does not support the creation of new nuclear power stations. In light of the comments made by the leader of Scottish Labour on nuclear energy, can I ask the FM <clears throat> whether the Scottish Government considers it necessary for taxpayers to fund the creation of new nuclear power, given the time and significant cost associated with it, when Scotland is already a renewable powerhouse? First Minister. Um, I absolutely agree uh, with Bill Kidd. I think we've got to invest uh, in the energy sources uh, that will get us to net zero, but also deliver the best deal uh, for uh, taxpayers uh, and for energy consumers. Uh, renewables, storage, hydrogen, carbon capture, uh, that's what provides us with the best pathway, not an easy pathway, but the best pathway to net zero by 2045. Nuclear power is a really, really bad deal for the bill payer, and that's before we take account of the fact uh, that waste is incredibly difficult to deal with. Uh, I've already uh, spoken about the increased cost for Hinkley Point C, uh, but internal analysis shows that in 2030 alone, Hinkley could add almost £40 a year to a consumer bill, while the equivalent offshore wind farm would reduce consumer bills by £8 uh, a year. So let's invest in the clean sources of energy uh, that will get us to net zero, but also deliver a better deal for bill payers now and in the future. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I look forward to the publication of that internal research. Hunterson B stopped recruiting apprentices three years ago. Torness is moving towards the end of its life under present conditions. What does the First Minister say to all of those apprentices who should be learning the skills, who should be learning the technology, and should lead Scotland forward in its economic recovery? First Minister. I, I want to see uh, massive opportunities for apprentices, uh, for new workers, for workers 
uh, already employed in oil and gas and nuclear in the low carbon green technologies of the future, like renewable energy, where Scotland has vast potential uh, in hydrogen and carbon capture, which unfortunately has been dealt uh, a blow by the UK government in the Scottish context. These uh, are the sources of energy that we should be supporting and investing heavily in because they are better for our environment, but they will also offer uh, the jobs and the opportunities for young people now and in the future. That is what this government is behind, and I hope we see the whole parliament get behind it too. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what discussions have taken place between the Scottish Government and the postal and banking sectors regarding the continued access to everyday services, particularly for rural, digitally excluded and vulnerable customers. First Minister. Access to banking and postal services is vitally important, particularly for rural communities and vulnerable or digitally excluded consumers. Uh, any reduction in branch numbers raises concerns regarding the ability to access these services. Of course, the regulation of financial and postal services is reserved to the UK Government. Uh, Scottish Ministers are therefore restricted in the intervention we can take. However, we do engage with the financial services sector regularly, and I will re-emphasise the importance of this when I shortly convene the Financial Services Advisory board. Uh, we have also repeatedly made clear to the UK Government and Post Office Limited that they have a responsibility to ensure existing postal services are maintained rather than reduced. Jamie Green. Uh, the First Minister will, will be aware, as many of us in the Chamber will know, that more than half of local bank branches have been lost in Scotland since 2010. Uh, customers were sent instead to post offices for their everyday banking, but we are now lo losing many of those too. In my region alone, we have lost post offices in Greenock, Irvine, Port Glasgow, Weems Bay. I appreciate that temporary measures uh, have been introduced in some areas, and that is most welcome, but it is unclear what the long-term plans are, particularly for rural and elderly customers, as the First Minister rightly pointed out. I do appreciate these are also commercially driven uh, decisions in many cases, but can I ask what constructive and positive conversations the Scottish Government with the UK Government could have with these sectors and local communities to ensure that no one is left behind. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government will continue to engage uh, with financial services companies, uh, with the post office, as I have said, uh, I have uh, reiterated today uh, that we will raise this at the next meeting of the Financial Services Advisory Board. I have had discussions personally. My ministers have had discussions uh, about how these services can best be delivered, particularly in rural areas, to make sure people have equitable access. Uh, these decisions are often commercially driven, but I think it is really important uh, that businesses remember uh, the wider needs of their customers and consumers. Uh, in terms of discussions with the UK Government, um, I would be delighted to be joined by Jamie Green in asking the UK Government to do more to regulate, better regulate uh, financial uh, services uh, and postal services in this area. Uh, so perhaps he can uh, make those representations alongside the Scottish Government. And if the UK Government is not willing to do that and has not been willing to do that so far, perhaps this is an area where they would uh, like to devolve these uh, powers to this Parliament so we can build on the consensus that clearly exists here um, and do something about it ourselves. Paul King. Uh, thank you, thank you, Presiding Officer. More must be done uh, to support post office provision, not only in rural communities but also in town centres. In the town of Port Glasgow, in my region, there is no post office, which is remarkable in a town of almost 15,000 people. Often, when post offices close, community groups and local development trusts wish to take the services on, but can't get off the ground due to funding issues or resourcing issues. So, will the First Minister look at how we might better fund community capacity to be able to offer these services and retain them in communities? First Minister. Uh, yes, we will always look at that. Uh, we already do uh, look at how we can support communities to take assets uh, into community ownership, uh, not just in uh, this area, uh, but more generally. So I think that is a constructive way that this government can uh, help to use its powers and resources. But as is so often the case, uh, what we end up being called upon to do uh, as, as government is put a sticking plaster uh, on the actions or inactions of the UK government. So again, perhaps uh, the member from the other side of the chamber will join those of us on the government uh, side of the chamber here to say, why wouldn't, we, wouldn't it be better to take these powers and responsibilities into the hands of this parliament so we can tackle some of the root causes of this and not just constantly have to be a sticking plaster for the actions or inactions of a Tory government at Westminster. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to a SEPA investigation uncovering the single largest illegal export of household waste from Scotland, resulting in Saikana Tour UK Limited being fined £20,000. 
First Minister. Well, this kind of behaviour is totally unacceptable. Uh, the company's actions were illegal and they were also environmentally damaging. They also undermine uh, Scotland's wider recycling efforts. So the prosecution sends a very clear signal to uh, everyone that waste must be managed responsibly and sustainably. Um, as in this case, SEPA routinely carry out proactive inspections at Scottish ports and loading sites to ensure compliance with the very strict waste shipment regulations. SEPA will continue to prioritise the regulation of waste, waste exports from Scotland to ensure that the environment is protected. It is, of course, for the courts to decide what level of fine is appropriate in any case. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her response and I pay tribute to the CPA officers involved in detecting this serious and, frankly, disgusting environmental crime. What was supposed to be bales of waste paper included used nappies and period products, dog excrement and plastic packaging. Dozens of these containers were intercepted in Antwerp and in transit to China. I appreciate the fine is a matter for the courts, but does the First Minister agree that £20,000 is, is a paltry fine for this filthy crime and that we do need more robust punishment in order to deter these sorts of crimes? What action will the Scottish Government take to ensure that our regulatory and legal framework are fit for purpose and that we can show leadership in terms of environmental justice and fulfil our moral and legal obligations not to export our pollution to other countries. First Minister. Well, I think it is important uh, to say, and, and I think Monica Lennon did recognise this, that this case is actually a sign that a regulatory framework is working. Um, and it is a credit to SEPA uh, that uh, this illegal export of waste uh, was intercepted, identified, and a prosecution uh, and a punishment fine uh, happened. In terms of the fine, it is for a court, for the sheriff in this case, to decide the appropriate level of fine. And I know the sheriff in this case uh, highlighted uh, some of the reasons uh, why the fine was set at that level. There is a, a sentencing, uh, possible sentencing range, uh, so the fines could have been uh, much higher than that, but it is for the sheriff to take account of the circumstances and decide what is appropriate. And uh, while we all want to see cases like this uh, appropriately dealt with, it would be really wrong for me to second-guess the sentencing decisions of any sheriff or judge in the country. Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Given that 98 per cent of plastic waste is not recycled here, Will the First Minister back Scottish Conservative calls to reduce waste exports and create jobs by building a new recycling plant for plastics here in Scotland? First Minister. Well, we want to uh, take a range of actions uh, to make sure that we reduce waste and increase recycling. And in fact, just last week, the Minister for the Circular Economy announced the first of the investments from the £70 million recycling improvement uh, fund uh, to increase the quantity and quality of recycling. Um, and that marks the beginning of one of the biggest investments in recycling in Scotland. So we'll continue uh, to consider suggestions from wherever they come so that we are fully playing our part to reducing uh, and appropriately dealing with waste here in Scotland, uh, which is an important part of fulfilling our environmental imperative. Julian Mackay. Presiding officer, I think that was a request, an earlier question. Thank you, Ms Mackay. Call Fulton McGregor. Um, thank you, thank presiding you. officer. Um, the First Minister will be aware that 11 residents at Millbury Care Home in my constituency were mistakenly given a saline solution instead of the COVID-19 vaccine in December last year. I understand the situation was quickly rectified by NHS Lanarkshire and no harm was caused to residents. However, can the First Minister offer reassurance that this incident was an isolated case and that all affected residents and their families were offered the appropriate support at the time? First Minister. Uh, yes, I am able to offer that assurance. I, I know that the Health Board has apologised for any distress that was caused uh, by the incident at Milbury Care Home. Uh, I can confirm uh, that uh, the Health Board at the time uh, gave a, a, an assurance uh, to us that no harm was caused. Uh, all residents affected were notified along with their families and received the appropriate vaccine the same day with no adverse effects. Vaccinators within the Health Board area were made aware of the error with incident reporting being strengthened in the Lanark system and measures were put in place immediately by health boards to prevent any similar incidents in future. Faisal Chowdhury. First Minister, uh, several of my Lothian constituents have written to me to complain about both the COVID-19 booster and the flu vaccine rollout. One constituent wrote to me saying 
I have been on the NHS website to try and book a flu and COVID boost, booster jack, but there are no appointments in either Armadale, Bathgate or Livingstone. For the foreseeable future, can you help? F First, First Minister, Minister, will you help my constituent? What measures would be put in place to ensure that the flu vaccination and COVID-19 booster rollout is faster to outpace the Delta variant and ensure that we will not head into winter with vulnerable people left unprotected? First Minister. Well, my, my thanks to Fazal Chowdhury for that question. It is really important to, uh, that we, as I said in my statement earlier this week, that we continue to accelerate the pace of the vaccination programme. Um, we have uh, had concerns raised um, about the rollout in Lothian, and officials have been engaging with NHS Lothian, who are making improvements to that. Um, appointments are becoming, this, not simply in Lothian, but countrywide. More appointments are being uh, made available through the online booking system every day now, and I would encourage people to go on uh, if they uh, are about to pass the 24-week point since their second dose to book uh, their booster and their flu vaccine. I did it uh, myself uh, yesterday, and I see, saw then in doing that the number of appointments that were uh, coming and flowing through that system. Uh, it is the case that the vaccination programme is going well. We are the most vaccinated part of the UK. I think we are uh, running as fast as Delta in that respect right now, but we cannot be complacent. We need to get as many people vaccinated with first, second, third and booster doses and flu vaccine um, as fast as possible. And that is what we are giving absolute focus to every day. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The First Minister said that Greater Glasgow and Clyde was at the highest level of escalation. That is simply incorrect, and I am genuinely surprised that she got it wrong, given that she is a former Health Secretary. Greater Glasgow and Clyde is at stage four of the escalation framework. The highest level is stage five, and it involves the Cabinet Secretary for Health using ministerial powers of intervention under the National Health Service Scotland Act of 1978. The last time this was used was in 2018 to remove the Chief Executive of NHS Tayside. So the First Minister is wrong. Will she correct the record and will she now act before families are devastated by the loss of loved ones? I thank Ms Bailey for her point of order. The member will be aware that the content of members' contributions is not normally a matter for the chair. Um, however, a mechanism does exist um, for members to correct any inaccuracies that have been made. Thank you.